My journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And strange as it may seem, my first step in a journey down the River Shannon begins with a visit to the Brigidine sisters at Sullisfrida in County Kildare. Rita, tell me a little bit about Sullisfrida and the flame of St. Bridget. Solis Friedana is a Christian spirituality centre with a focus on St. Bridget of Kildare. And tradition holds that a sacred fire burned in Kildare going way back over 1500 years into pre-Christian times. St. Bridget built a double monastery here in Kildare towards the end of the 5th century. Bridget's monastery was on the same site as the pre-Christian site. Tradition holds that she and her nuns kept the flame alight, the new light, the light of Christ, until possibly up until the 16th century, when all the monasteries in Ireland were suppressed. And in 1993, AFRI, Action from Ireland, in association with the Brigidine Sisters, hosted an international justice and peace conference here in Kildare Town, titled Bridget, Prophetess, Earth Woman, Peacemaker. And in preparing for that conference, we decided to relight once again the flame of Bridget in Kildare Town. So there was great excitement and a bowl of fire blazed in Kildare Market Square for the duration of that conference. And as we drew to the conclusion of the conference, we just said, this cannot be extinguished. We need to keep alight the Bridget flame. And Mary and Phil, two Brigidine sisters, and who are here with me today, decided that they would take a spark from the Bridget flame and tend it in their home in Kildare Town at that time. So, Anna, the little candle flame that burns in Solus Rita Centre today burns as a beacon of hope, justice and peace for our world. That's a wonderful story. And, of course... At that time, the centre wasn't built. That no, it came afterwards. That came much later. But the flame, by relighting it, I think, uh, it caught the imagination of people all over the world because we ha- had people arriving at our door asking us to see the flame of Bridget. So it ignited a flame around the world, really, this lighting of the Bridget flame. And it certainly caught my imagination when I came here a couple of years ago and I took the flame of St. Bridget home with me. And the beautiful thing about the St. Bridget flame is that you can light a candle, the blessing passes on to the new candle, and then from that on to the next candle, and so on and so forth. So it's just a wonderful concept of being able to pass the message of St. Bridget peace and justice around the world. It certainly is. Candles from this flame have found a home all over the world and people of all faiths and none are welcome here. And it's amazing what has happened since our opening of this new centre and before it. I was just thinking as the flame has been carried in and has been done over the years, in the 27 years since we began, the flame has been tended by the Brigadines here and there. And it's fantastic that that flame has been kept alive. And I think it's a very important symbol that we need, really, in what is kind of a bleak international landscape at the minute. There doesn't seem all that many reasons for hope. One of the great reasons is the many people here and many all over the world who are keeping the flame lit, who are continuing to walk the road, who are never giving up on the fight for justice, for peace and for the care of the planet. And I suppose the deep desire of my heart now is to carry the flame of St. Bridget down the Shannon. It's a wonderful dream that I have, and I suppose I'm about to set out on that journey. And we'd be delighted to give it to you, Anna. Anna, we give you the light of Bridget, a flame of justice and peace to accompany you as you set out on your pilgrim journey down the Shannon. May this flame shine a light on the increasing pollution of the river and on the urgent need to care for and to protect 
this majestic river for future generations. Thank you, Risha. So, Anna, a ridelet, Agus Fivrat Rida Shina Galeir, and may we all be under the protection of the cloak of St. Bridget. Mary, Risha, and Phil, I just want to thank you so much for your blessing today. It's very special. And I'm very excited now as I set out on this journey from the Shannon Pot to the Shannon Estuary. May the Lord protect me and go with me on this journey. And may he bless all those who join me on the journey. Amen. Amen. Shannon, first mapped in the 2nd century AD by the Roman geographer Ptolemy, is named after Shanna, a Celtic goddess, and it's the longest river in Ireland, flowing through or between no fewer than 11 counties, draining a fifth of the country's land. The Shannon Pot is a small pool on the slopes of the Quilca Mountains in County Cavan, and it's said to be the starting point for the river. From here, it winds its way in a southwesterly direction through the village of Dowra, before reaching the head of Loch Allen, the first of the three great lakes on the river. And it's here I begin my journey down the river to the estuary, carrying the pure drop of water taken from its source and the flame of St Bridget. I'm hoping to meet with people at the different stages of my journey to discuss with them the importance of protecting the river for future generations. So we're all aboard the barge. We're about to head on adventure down the Shannon from Loch Allen to the estuary. And today we hope to make it as far as Carrick and Shannon. And I'm joined by five very special people. Our planet is under threat. A recent UN report told us if we don't take action in the next 12 years, we're facing catastrophic consequences. So I think we need to do everything possible to alert people to the urgency of the situation that we live in and the need for urgent action now. And there's nothing more important for ourselves, for our planet, for our children, than to preserve the integrity and the beauty of this extraordinary jewel of the universe. I'm at the granny age, if you like. And if we don't do something now, children who could be my grandchildren will have nothing left for them. We're polluting the environment well, one of the big problems I see in Ireland and elsewhere is degradation of the soil, degradation of the water, generally speaking, degradation of the earth. And just a statistic that came out a few days ago, 60% of wildlife has disappeared in the past 40 years. Now, that's within my lifetime, well within my lifetime. So if 60% has disappeared within 40 years, what's going to happen in the next 40 or even the next 15, because everything seems to be accelerating. My background was in science, and what happens to wildlife happens to us eventually. So unless we get our act together, we'll have nothing left for the generation that's coming up and the generation after that. The impacts are just becoming greater and greater as the years go by. And the impacts on the Shannon come from many different sources. They come from inappropriate types of farming, which I would say. And I think we have worked in the co-op for years to get more people to farm in a sustainable way, through organic methods to try and take more care for how they farm and to look at the impacts along the farm. With Waterways Ireland, now they have this basin management catchment plans. We are also working with them because they are also monitoring runoff from farms and we have to get back again thinking quite differently about how we farm. We need to be thinking about the type of flora and fauna, the type of animals we keep, how we manage runoff from our land and how we better control water flows because we are getting more intense rainfall patterns. So we need to be, you know, rather than drainage, we need to stop draining. We need to, to look at very different ways. We need to see farms as buffers to prevent strong runoffs of water that then come into our towns and you could see the impacts some years back in Carrick and Shannon. And I know there's great work going on at the moment to try and make sure that that doesn't happen again. But I think we have to prepare ourselves for much different 
times ahead when adaptation of animals and plants will come under a lot of pressure. There is an organization just starting now called Tholov, which again is about people returning again to the land. It's, it's an organization that will see a farming as not just something to be part-time, but as something that's absolutely fundamental to regeneration in the countryside, but also protection of land and water. There are communities living along the Shannon, in small little villages and towns that have been there for donkey's years and centuries. And they're under threat. We have rural depopulation, we have the centres of these towns and villages empty, we have the youth of those towns and villages living elsewhere, maybe on the eastern seaboard or in fact abroad. And what we are trying to do in Waterways Ireland in a very sustainable and holistic manner is support those towns and villages and communities that live along our waterways through the development of activities on those waterways, through the development of infrastructure that allows access to the waterways, in how we can support the communities in doing it for themselves, utilising the natural assets which is the waterways but also the built assets that are there and have been there because of the waterways you know we're coming full circle in when we talk about sustainability that it's not build it and they will come it is build it for the local people first and if it becomes a tourism attraction or a recreational amenity all the better. The corn crake is gone from the callows and that's really because of flooding. We now have that rapid climate change and the heavy rainfalls etc etc. But we see new species of flora and fauna because of climate change right around the globe. So it's a balance we have to find but yes we have serious issues ahead of us with regard to the management and maintenance of this unique and beautiful landscape. Education and awareness is a huge part of protecting and nurturing for future generations our environment. And through creative projects, whether it's art or music or uh, writing, and I suppose the reason people come to Ireland is because of the beauty of our island. One of the things we do is bring writers into the schools, bring environmentalists, bring children on walks, you know, just open up their eyes to the beauty of our landscape. I think one of the big threats currently is a harvesting of timber and activities associated with monoculture Sitka spruce. What happens in Loch Allen won't stay there, it will permeate right down through the Shannon itself. And as farmers, we are concerned what we have been asking for is a moratorium and a study to look at the effects of this type of monoculture <coughs> planting on the environment and certainly we are proposing many other alternative forestry types including agroforestry which could be practiced which would involve farmers not just multinational funds that are looking at short rotation forestry as a way of, of making a quick buck but we want farmers to be involved in the future farming of land whether it's for timber fiber whatever it is the other thing that we're certainly encouraging amongst our members is looking at ecotourism and looking at farms as multifunctional. So a farmer there could have people coming and staying on the farm, taking people with various different needs, they've been drug misusers or they have some other incapacity that they can be rehabilitated through farming and farming systems rather than the more historical way of putting people into institutions. The vast majority of people want to preserve our Shannon that we're on today, they want to preserve our planet but it's been destroyed by a very few. And I think what we need to be is more proactive. We need to demand action of our government. Uh, it's not enough for them to be passive observers of an unfolding tragedy. They must get more proactive. Farming has gotten a bad name, really, because of the sins of a few. In large, these are not farmers at all. It's a type of industry that's called farming, intensive forms of farming, which are extremely destructive and really have to stop. We just cannot continue. We cannot sustain this into the future. We can learn a lot from the way that our parents lived. They lived a lot more sustainably. Farming was a lot more organic. We didn't live in a throwaway society. So we've got to learn from our history and we've got to adapt to the urgent demands that confront us today. I think a healthy natural environment is one of the most wonderful resources 
any country can have, we can pass on to generations to come. It is our job, each of us, not just Waterways Ireland or the local authorities or Irish Water or the ESB or the OPW, who all have an interest in this water body, but it is up to every individual and every community to ensure that they pass this wonderful landscape on to the next generation in as good, if not a better, condition. Creative Ireland is a relatively new programme. It's the government recognising how important our cultural well-being is and how inspired people are by the environment that they live in and how important it is to protect that but also to make some of our cultural assets more accessible to people. The area we're coming through today, Drumshambo, beautiful town, they have some wonderful festivals, the Joe Mooney Summer School and many of the visitors that will come to Drumshambo during the festival will be on the boats enjoying the town, enjoying the beautiful walkways, enjoying nature. Many people who come for festivals like this, they come from all over Europe. So cultural tourism is a very important part of our economy. The work that's been done by organisations like Waterways Ireland, the Blue Way Festival, Carrick and Shannon, which will be arriving in later on, has so many festivals around the River Shannon. It's probably our most important, I would say, cultural asset. Indeed, Lanesborough had the first environmental summer school in Ireland and as part of that is a summer school for teachers. Let us bless the humility of water, always willing to take the shape of whatever otherness holds it. The buoyancy of water, stronger than the deadening downward drag of gravity. The innocence of water, flowing forth without thought of what awaits it. The refreshment of water, dissolving the crystals of thirst. Water, voice of grief, cry of love in the flowing tear. Water, vehicle and idiom of all the inner voyaging that keeps us alive. Blessed be water, our first mother. Absolutely beautiful and a lovely thought for the start of our journey. Stop off in Drumshambo and Leitrim village before berthing for the night in Carrick and Shannon. And what better way to spend the evening than to head into Cryens to meet up with Sean Ward, an old acquaintance who regularly leads a trad session there. Despite a late night in Cryens, it was an early hearty breakfast and a leisurely walk around Carrick to begin day two of our journey down the river. Today we're travelling from Carrick and Shannon down to Lanesborough and I'm joined by three guests, Dr Ina Kelly, Kay Baxter and Paddy Gilboy. The boat hire business some years ago had about 500 boats, it now has 212. In the past, limited number of boats had control of sewage on their systems. Today, Waterways Ireland seals those tanks and those tanks are pumped out on return every Saturday. So there is no sewage emitting from or being discharged into the water system. That's absolutely brilliant. Mm. Well, the increase in population in Ireland is putting stress on all our resources, not just the Shannon. There's been a massive population explosion in the Greater Dublin area and we have all heard about the demands for water and that the Dublin local authorities are not going to be able to meet those demands. Now they're proposing they're going to build this vastly expensive pipeline um, from Parteen down at Limerick and pipe the water the whole way to Dublin. We're really concerned in this area that is going to have a huge adverse impact on the Shannon from the top to the bottom and all the communities that are fed by the Shannon. The Shannon courses through two-thirds of our country. Most users of the Shannon have two 
aspects in mind. The Shannon is either for an activity, such as kayaking or swimming or fishing or boating, or for tranquility to get away from the stress of everyday life. And they're hugely important for public health, for people's mental and physical well-being. The river is a massively important part of that. Really, until such time as we've had one big national body that can invest properly in water services, it's been very challenging for our local authorities to do that. And, you know, there have been boundary issues across counties and water authority areas. So I think that there's definitely a potential for Irish water to do better than we've had done previously. But that doesn't mean that it isn't a challenging problem. And I understand the fears that people have on the Shannon about the use of water in other parts of the country when there are already problems within the Shannon area itself, you know, with water levels and so on. And there are so many influences on the Shannon We've heard of flooding for the last two or three years, for whatever reason. But the summer, if you look at the water levels today, if you extract water from it, you certainly will have a major problem for navigation. The Inland Waterways Association of Ireland are advocating for one statutory body to oversee the water levels and water abstraction from the Shannon. You have Waterways Ireland managing the levels from a navigation point of view. You have the ESB managing the levels from a power generation point of view. You have Irish Water looking to impact on the levels to take water from the Shannon. And then you have obviously the, the likes of the farmers bodies not advocating for the levels to be dropped so the farmland and the homes and businesses aren't flooded which of course is very, very important too. The flood mitigation has to happen. Nobody wants to see a repeat of what's happened in the past, but it has to be done in a controlled measure. And there needs to be one body who can control the level of water and say, no, you can't have your water at the moment because of X, Y, Z, or yes, water levels are rising. Let's give more to the ESB and generate more power. But there needs to be just one body controlling that. Another issue we have on the Shannon is the current there is less than 18 metres of a fall from Loch Allen to Arnagrusia. I mean, that is very, very small current of water. So any residual or any bacteria or any solids, they're not being brought away. They're being held there. And we know what happens to water, that it's stale. Funguses and bacteria grow in those areas. It's not able to flush itself out in the summer. It will do that, obviously, in the winter or sometimes in flood. It's a very, very flat river and vulnerable for that reason. Drinking water, which is such an essential part of our lives, we do need to make sure that we think about the needs of everybody. And it's very clear when we're talking about the Shannon here that there are so many different needs and they're all very valid and they're very important. And it's important that they're all taken into account on decision making because when we leave out some important criteria when we're making decisions, these impacts come back later on in some other way. And it's important that everybody's involved, that they're heard in the decision making process because all of these activities that people are doing and the essential and recreational and so on, they're all very much part of our essential lives. And when people are suffering as a result of inadequate decision making or poor decision making, those effects are very serious for the health of the public. Now it's all about activity tourism bringing economy to the local communities and they're very, very dependent on it. And it's been lovely to see in the last couple of years, you know, things like you know, the development of the Blue Way just north of here, um, from Leitrim the whole way to Carrick and Shannon and through up the Boyle River and through there for a very small investment. I believe it cost in the region about 300000 and its first year in operation it brought in three million to the local economy in the area. For that reason as well, you know, people's livelihoods have to be protected. The local economy, rural Rural Ireland doesn't have the same economic growth factors as the larger urban areas, so we have to protect what's there, and the Shannon is a huge part of that. And I think that's where you get the pressure coming from. It's not just from the waterways enthusiasts, it's from the business communities that have invested heavily on activities relating to the Shannon. We're all interdependent, and it's important that that interdependence is completely acknowledged and recognised in decision-making. And The value and the quality of the work people are doing and the livelihoods people have are valued because if we don't value those things what is the point of it you know for sustainable communities we have to value what people are doing yeah the small little villages and towns along the Shannon and the Shannon area waterway there'll be no tourists coming in except for the waterway at the end of their garden or under their bridge that has the spin-off of employment in cleaning boats and servicing boats and instructing boats that is a huge amount of financial contribution it certainly would be very quiet without it 
I think we're very lucky in that we have some excellent support from local councillors. Deputy Eamon O'Keefe is a huge supporter of the waterways and protecting the navigations. We have many local councillors as well who are lobbying hard to protect because again it's affecting their local areas and the local economies so they are putting pressure on government but it's something that is an ongoing battle and I think it will be for a number of years to come. What we want of course is to protect this fabulous resource for our grandchildren and their children and their children to make sure that the Shannon is always feeding the communities of Ireland. I think the water on the Shannon is definitely improving and I can see it myself in my own business from lifting boats and you can know the colour of the water. Every year it's improving. I mean, people are more conscientious about what they dispose into the Shannon, whether it is by way of refuse or water, sewage or exhaust fumes. If we can get one body to control the water levels in the Shannon. I think that's really, really important. And all the different activities, the stand-up paddleboarding, the kayaking, the rowing clubs, the sailing clubs, they're all hugely important for people's health. It has to be protected, as well as being an economic boost to the area. They're hugely important for mental and physical health of the population. We're not disconnected from the north and south. It is a long river, there's no doubt about that. But every bit of it is used. And believe it, any little message or good or bad news that starts on the North Shannon within very minutes is of the South Shannon. There's so much value there. Any big decisions about the Shannon need to consider all of the important livelihoods, the recreation, the health benefits, physical, mental and social, sustainability into the future, climate resilience. All of these things need to be taken into account when big decisions are being made because we, sometimes you can't go back. And it's very important that we don't destroy anything, that we value what is there and that the people who are making decisions know about that before they decide anything about how they use the Shannon into the future. It would be my hope that we'd give back to Shannon in a better condition than we got it in. I've gone to many boat shows in Europe when I was in the boat charter business. Foreigners would say, is there many boats on the Shannon? And that time I would have said every boat had a thousand acres of water. And in fact, I'd say that has gone up since because boat numbers have gone down. There is plenty of room on the Shannon to absorb more activity. I have developed a floating house. And I think that there is room for something like that. It's been done in England, it's been done in Holland, in Vancouver, in Australia, in many places. It certainly is another area that will be developed, I think, and I put the first one in Ireland on the Shannon myself. Andy managed to dock in Lanesborough, and as the light faded, I had enough time to take a leisurely stroll around the town before heading into Clark's, a famous Irish music pub, to a session led by renowned Longford Piper, Noel Carberry and Johnny Duffy. A perfect end to a perfect day. of my journey down the Shannon. This morning I set out from Lanesborough where the river separates County Longford from County Roscommon. My journey today will be all along Loch Ree with its many places of historical interest and hopefully by evening time we'll reach Athlone. Andy, as always, is diligent at the helm. much for joining me this morning from Lanesborough on to Lockery and on to Athlone and it's just wonderful having us. We took it upon ourselves to start a big major clean up. When you see the level of rubbish that we took out of such a small area in relation to Shannon and that's echoed right up the whole Shannon estuary. We send the message to people if you have your litter keep it in your pocket or put it in the bin because those paper bags, those tato bags, those caps of bottles, it interferes not just with the Shannon itself but the fish life. 
everything that evolves in relation to the Shannon has a major effect on it. So I send the message clear to people to protect the Shannon. Here we are heading to Athlone. We're talking about 50 million of a new storage network system for the town of Athlone. It's the main drainage. And this is something that coincides with the development of the flood walls and the defences that's been built around Athlone. We have a combined sewer system. And if we don't put in this new system, the storage system backs up and it goes into some people's homes and then onto the street and creates huge, huge problems. So that's not just here in Athlone. That's right up the whole Shannon estuary that we need to protect Shannon where we have raw surge in a number of locations being pumped in. As an angler we're in a unique situation because of the very creature that is at the heart of our sport and that's fish because what a fish is really is the litmus paper of any water system and when they get affected we're in trouble. We see the tragic circumstances in other smaller rivers of fish kills well at that stage it's too late. Now we noticed that our fish stocks were plummeting and we have proof that the nutrients going into the Shannon are very, very high. We're lucky in another sense that the Shannon has such a dilution factor that the sheer volume of water in it prevented fish kills. The natural flood that comes flushes out the system, but in the late 70s, the 80s and into the 90s, the Shannon was really a dumping ground. Everything went into it, raw sewerage. We built dumps on the side of it on floodplains, nutrients from the farmland, intensive farming was coming into it. But thankfully, I think we have turned a corner. But we, the anglers, knew about this all along. And we very, very nearly lost our Shannon in the 80s and 90s. There is light at the end of the tunnel now, and thankfully we have a man like Boxer in high places to further our cause. Very recently um, in the news, there was a statement from the World Wildlife Fund that since the 1970s, the wildlife globally had diminished by 60%. Thinking about, well, what future will my child have and what is the River Shannon going to be like for them? It is scary (laughs) to think about. What if there's no fish in the Shannon? Will that be there in 20 years? This is a river of international significance It needs to be protected and restored where possible. And I'm hopeful that in the future it's there for my generation when I'm older and for the next generation to come to enjoy. I see the Shannon as a major infrastructure. It supports a whole industry from Leithrum down to Limerick in tourism in B&Bs, in fishing. It's a means of distributing wealth into smaller communities, etc., all along the river. That's one aspect of it that needs to be protected. This year in particular, it was a very, very dry year. There was very little rain. It went to a level of concern through the summer, and apart from affecting the ability of boats and others to to navigate and travel, it also affects the levels of tributaries, which, from the point of view of the fisheries, they're affecting the whole spawning process and all of that the whole ecology around the edges of the lake which supports all of that wildlife. It's a very delicate mechanism which all has to be balanced. I mean we've all talked about the ecology but there's the industry and the commercial side of things has to be looked after as well. 70% of Irish water comes from natural rivers and lakes. It's actually protected under the European Framework Directive. It's illegal to pollute drinking water. Government can preach and practice about money, but we need people to catch on to this. And we need people to be mindful that the Shannon is theirs. Everyone that goes to school in the morning or goes up the lake in the evening, they have to realise a butt of a cigarette, as I say, the cap of a bottle can do so much harm. These are things that are all entering the water system and damaging it, raw sewerage and, and the fact that that enters our waterways and there's other like harmful pesticides and microbeads, which fortunately were recently banned for use. But it doesn't seem to be getting across in media as much as it could, I think. And it's certainly something I make people aware of, but they weren't aware of it previously. There's a lot of buildings that back onto the Shannon and we don't face out to it and look at it, you know, and it's only certain areas along the Strand where people might sit and look and and really appreciate what a great feature it is. And I think there's car parks and there's derelict buildings and I think there's a lot more that can be done so that the town can face it more and people can embrace it and appreciate it more. And with that will hopefully come an awareness of how great a river it is and how beneficial it is to have it there. 
But if you look at the school programme at the moment, you talk about recycling and the green flags. I think it's an area, particularly the schools along the Shannon, would have teachers to go and educate the kids. The dropping as much as, a, as I say, a lid bottle into the Shannon, the danger it can do. But also talk about the development of the towns along the Shannon. What can we do to protect them? What can we do to enhance them? What can we do for tourism? But I think the schools would have a big part to play in relation to how we look at the Shannon going into the future. It's a whole culture. If you look at the history, the monuments, it's like a museum on the Shannon. St. Kieran of Clamacnoy's fame, he started here on Air Island, up near Coosin Point there, just before he went downstream to find Clamacnoy's. St. Brendan, the navigator, he was down at Lanfert. So there's a whole series of monastic settlements all over Loch Ree in particular. There's evidence of Vikings coming up here. Just on Air Island alone, there was always reputed to be the largest Viking hoard of gold found. You had a Viking town developed up on the west bank, up at Rendoon. So there's all sorts of historical things that should be really protected as well or not kept in mind and kept it to the forefront. Even ourselves, just to go and walk around them. Exactly. You don't have to be boating on, uh, on the Shannon. You can swim, you can fish, you can kayak, canoe, mm. you can walk or you can cycle. Recently I started working closely with a heritage group in Clara. What the woolen mills and what that has done to industry. The OPW in particular were over there doing a lot of river work over there at the present time for them. The history of even Hare Island, when there was a pig or a lamb or whatever was killed, the other islands had no to come and get a piece of the thing that evening because there was smoke let off in one island. Everyone knew that was the place to go. Then coming into town on a Friday... The woman had sit at the top of the boat and the man had row into town. But going back up the river that night, she'd be rowing and he'd be sitting <laughs> at the back of the boat with a few jars in him. And the history of that and the people who lived on the island is phenomenal education for kids, but it's phenomenal for tourism. At the end of last year, where I let all children under the age of 12 into all OPW sites free all over the country, in the first six months, 90,000 people went through the doors of the OPW. This year, I let all people with disabilities and their carers free, but it's a great incentive to get people off the computer, off the phone, and to see where our heritage came from. I feel privileged to have been born into a lifestyle of fishing. My grandfather, my father before me, I know nothing else. I love it, as we all do. We all have our own interests in our different organisations, but we all have one common denominator, and that is the love of the Shannon. And we will relentlessly protect it. Most of the fish now caught in the Shannon are released. It's all catch and release. Every fishing competition is where you catch fish, they're weighed and let back into the Shannon. We have progressed in our lifetimes so fast. We have literally gone from smoke signals to spy satellites in one lifetime, as far as technology is concerned. And that is good. But when we're progressing, at the rate we're progressing, the natural system, the natural environment cannot keep up with us. 30% of the brood fish that go to spawn run from Loch Ree to the Camblin system which is north of Loch Ree. When the fish come as far as Tarman Barry there is no proper fish pass for them. A very small percentage of them actually run the Camblin system. While we're progressing with the floods, while we're progressing with the infrastructure, we've got to cater for the wildlife. With industrial peat harvesting, that has had a devastating impact on the Shannon. And I think that's something that now that we're moving away from fossil fuels and we have to, you know, it's, it's become an emergency and become an urgency to do that. I think we have to look at restoring our boglands and our wetlands. And, and that's a softer solution that can help the general wildlife. And I think I'm happier now, I guess, than maybe a few years ago, that there's more of a focus in government on the Shannon as an ecosystem. There's more of a focus on the benefits it can bring to local communities in terms of tourism. And certainly I went out to Rindoon last year for the first time. I had never heard about it and I read about it in an Aer Lingus magazine and it was only down the road and it's just beautiful to walk around there. So I think um, keeping these places, making people and local people more aware of them and it's great work that you're doing with the schools, I think that should continue and government should really help support that. So people my age and people younger and my kids can really get involved and appreciate it. I'm optimistic that if we continue our efforts and focus them, that the future for the Shannon can be better than it has been. Well, that's a lovely note on which to end. <laughs> Bye.
arrived in Athlone as the light was fading and I headed straight for Sean's Bar, which is reputed to be the oldest pub in the world. There's always an Irish music session there. of my journey down the river carrying the flame of St Bridget and the pure drop of water taken from the Shannon pot. Athlone Castle was built in the 13th century beside a bridge which separates Leinster from Connacht and throughout history has been a very strategic point on the river. Yes, all united with a love of the Shannon. Going back to the early days when Clown McNoise was set up, it was deliberately chosen because it was the crossroads between the Shannon and the Escarida. That spot had been chosen in pre-Christian times. And of course the Shannon was the highway to Clown McNoise when it developed and became a monastic city with possibly a population of 4,000 people. But of course not all the visitors came to learn Christianity. We have the Viking invasions and Shinsuke Lella. The future of tourism is going to be about this thing they call experiential tourism, which is about experiencing a location and so on. The old idea of package tours and so on, that's dying. I think that the Shannon fits solidly into that because it's not enough anymore to just have people come and look at physical locations and things like that. They want to experience the stories, the myths, the inside experience of that. And the Shannon is rich in terms of its heritage. You know, the power of myth and story is very important. And I think we're losing those. And when we lose those, you know, in a sense, we're losing our sense of society. So I think there are lots of reasons for us to reinvigorate that side of things and to bring it to the attention of the international audience because that's what they're hungering for now. And I think that Ireland can tap into it through the Shannon. The Shannon itself was a sacred place in prehistory. The name itself comes from the name of a water goddess, which was Shannon. Ancient people here, they made their offerings to their gods in the river, travelled along the river, they had their settlement along the river, and indeed the civilization of Ireland grew up along its waterways and, of course, along the coast because Ireland being an island, the way that people came to the country was, first of all, by the sea, coming up from the Mediterranean and along the Atlantic coast, and then ultimately from the coastal areas of Ireland into the heartland, remembering now that the country was covered with forests and there was no effective way of getting about except through the rivers. So it was along the rivers that civilization really started in Ireland. And then you had the trading, later on you had the monks and the scholars and so on, all centered around the river. And then of course it goes right through the core of Ireland. So in a sense the river, the River Shannon in particular, is really the heart of Ireland. If its story is fully told, it will resonate with a lot of people. So I think there's a very interesting aspect where you can bring the past into the present and on to the future. So it can be a unifying force in that way. And also a unifying force between East and West, and I would say even between country and town, because as our kind of urbanized society develops, People are going to need more and more a natural environment around the Shannon, need the storylines around the Shannon, and need that kind of break from the urban environment to basically to sustain themselves. Well, water beings were affected by the moon, were affected by the tides. The baptism, water, and so it's like initiation, you know, all of that. So I think it's so interlinked, you know, physically, the need for pure water and uh, all of that. Mentally, just the fresh air, That because when our air goes and when our water goes, we're gone, aren't we really, as beings of the planet? So 
God, you know, where, where do you start even with around the physical, mental, the emotional element of water, the sacred earth, the sacred mother, the sacred rivers, the rivers signifying the rapids that we run into in life, the meandering of the journey when, when times are going good and the river is me meandering around, or the little trickle, or how she weaves her way in and out of crevices. And we have to do that in life. We have to yeah. sort ourselves out and get out of difficult spots, if you like. And then, you know, the journey to the sea, into the depths of ocean and into the dark night of the soul, as they say, in search of meaning. It's so interconnected and it's so a part of us, yeah. yeah. Yes. It's getting that detachment from the hustle and bustle of life, you know, and mm. being able to go somewhere quiet. I mean, just even in relation to my own children, like the amount of amenities that are in Athlone. We have Hudson Bay Sports. I will bring the camper van out to Loch Ray. It's so peaceful. It's so quiet. They can do fishing. They can do kayaking. They have a wonderful time. We have poetry in the park here in Athlone where we would all gather down at the Shannon. And people who have a love of poetry and the spoken word would just gather down by the river and take the time out just to exchange their passion. Where would we be without being able to bring the children down for a picnic down by the river? So it's that connection people have with nature, isn't it? There are a lot of musicians here in town who would use the River Run Cruiser and they would play their music on the boat. People can come and enjoy sailing along the boat, listening to the music, have a bite to eat maybe, at the Sean's Bar area in Athlone, to be able to sit out and have a cup of coffee and just look at the river. I think a lot of people use the river without actually realising, and they take it for granted. Do you know, it would, I suppose it's only when something is not there. Unfortunately, we've turned our back on the river historically. It is the natural focal point for all of the communities living along it. And I think what we need to do is to put a refocus on the river and really put a completely new emphasis on it. Carrick and Shannon has rejuvenated itself by turning its face away from the river towards the river. And by doing that, it has rejuvenated the entire town. It did that in the past historically, you know, pre-Christian times and so on. That's where the civilization in Ireland really got going along the rivers. And so we just need to take a leaf from that very old book and do it again instead of turning our back on the river. So turn towards the river, face the river. There is an increase during the summertime of people hiring out cruisers and using it. I remember one day counting about 17 cruisers tied up there, which is remarkable. The Cross of the Scriptures at Clonmig Noise, that was carved about the year 900. There are three saints depicted on it. Only one of them is Irish, and that is St. Ciaran. The other two are Egyptian. The movement of the Desert Fathers just before the collapse of the Roman Empire, when Constantine made Christianity legal, in other words, when the persecution stopped. But just before that time, people went off to the deserts of Egypt to practice their Christianity, their religion, and that form made its way through France, through to Ireland, this monastic type of Christianity. On Ptolemy's map of Ireland, which he made about 150 AD, it even comes inland and shows Ishnoch. He just didn't sort of sail around the coast. And that's where the high kings lived before they went to Tara. So the Egyptians knew their way around Ireland. There is a lot of effort going into trying to turn people around about nature and about the natural environment. And I think it's working. But once that battle is won, then the job of materialising the plan and realising and so on is more than half done. But the big battle is winning hearts and minds. So the issue here in Ireland around the Shannon is to convince people about its invaluable nature as a resource for the whole island. And not just all of us in here in the 26th Cab, but... It also has the link, for example, potentially with the Erne, which is another major waterway. And that becomes the axis of Ireland. The Erne and the Shannon joined is a complete axis for this country. And so if we looked at it that way and tried to mobilise people around that concept, create awareness and win hearts and minds first, then the rest will happen. The social aspect of utilising the river is extremely important to bring communities together. It's an absolutely brilliant way of people coming together. The mental health issue yeah. is very important. People, people do need to have places where they can detach. Yeah. While some people might be interested in the historical aspect of it, mm -hmm. they don't realise they're actually using that, you know, yeah. and they're taking it for granted. But come a sunny day, that's where we go. I do think it's been utilised, but in terms of whether people are aware of the importance of looking after it, yeah. I'm not sure yeah. about that. 
The way you add value to the physical beauty of the place is by the storylines. The power of myth and stories is very important, and we have that in spades here in Ireland with the Shana Keys and our tradition and so on of that. So we just build that into virtual recreations of these sites. That'll be very interesting for people, and then perhaps the budgets and plans and so on to further develop it will come on the back of that. But that's a, a relatively inexpensive and straightforward way to start the ball rolling and increase awareness. In the whole psychotherapy field, it really is about when we lose connection with ourselves, then we're in trouble in some way, we're struggling. And the work is bringing people back into connection with self. It's about taking those pauses to what do I see around me? What do I hear? What do I smell? What do I taste? And sure, it's all nature based. It's the soothing, it's the holding, it's the carrying of the water, I'm sure. I'm going back to the indigenous people again and the responsibility that are on the elders. So I suppose sometimes I look and I say, what have we done? And look at what was given to us and what have we done to pass on to the next generation or the next seven generations they talk about? That concerns me around what are we going to do and where do we go from here? We have a kind of crisis of identity, really. Many of the things that underpinned our society here in Ireland have started to erode in the recent past. Generally, worldwide, there is a trend, particularly in the Western world, towards individualism. And individualism undermines the notion of society. I don't think that individualism is sustainable going forward. For us to kind of recreate our sense of community and society, we have to find new myths going forward. Some of the old myths have been abandoned, but that doesn't mean we abandon the whole idea of holding society together. We need to reimagine our society in terms of new myths. So I think, for example, the Shannon, that is already a natural connector, you need to build a myth around things like that. It's stories, it's traditions, it's myths. If you lose those, you've lost your society. When the traveller came to a monastery, he was given hospitality, and the hospitality meant the courtesy was you didn't ask him any questions of where he came from or what he was doing out in the middle of the night or what have you. But he was expected to entertain, to tell a story yes. or a poem or a myth or a song. That has been kept up certainly to my father's generation with the mm. rambling houses, but it's still mm. in us that need yes. to bring the glories and the treasures of the past yes. that benefit us in the future. Well, I think that's a lovely note on which to end our conversation today. Day four draws to a close and we're spending the night in Banagher. I was very fortunate to head to Carrigan's Bar and to meet up with three young musicians. All of them have won All-Ireland medals at Flack Yol na Heron. Michaela Keenahan, Luke Maher and Jack Kinsler. along the Shannon begins in Banagher, where the Shannon separates County Offaly from County Galway. As we set off on our journey towards Loch Derg, I have a great sense that we're about to have a very lively discussion. Well, my interest started off because I got a letter saying there was a pipeline proposed to take water through my farm to Dublin. So selfishly I said, oh, that doesn't sound right to me, like something's wrong. People said to me that it can't be stopped, it's inevitable that this pipe is going to go through. But the more and more we look into it, the more and more ridiculous it's getting. 
when you actually look at the water levels on Loch Derg and Loch Ree and on Loch Allen and the knock-on effect that the drought had the whole length of the Shannon. If this pipeline takes four cubic metres a second out of the Shannon at Pertine Weir, you will have a knock-on effect in a drought like last summer, which is going to be completely exaggerated. Irish Water talk about taking 2% of the annual flow of the Shannon. That's irrelevant when you have a flood, but that's going to be a disaster if you have a drought like you had last summer. Now, if there's a drought and with global warming, who knows what kind of summers we'll have in years to come, it's just not feasible. Plus the fact there are alternatives, there are aquifers, there's underground water, and relying on one source like the Shannon doesn't make sense, either economically, but mainly for our point of view, it's environmental. Okay. Just worry about the long-term effects of abstracting water, particularly in drought. And the drought time is when Dublin would be needing it most. I still believe that it is not the best way of meeting Dublin's real needs uh, uh, for water because I think there are very many other ways which would be better and cheaper for Dublin. The best way to promote waterways appreciation and use is to get a lot of different people involved, whether it's younger people like we're talking about today, whether it's different communities whether it's walkers, cyclists, canoeists or boaters. We're talking about several generations. All those different people appreciating the waterways and then from whatever's going to happen in terms of development, infrastructure or otherwise, there will be a body of interest there to be engaged with and they in turn can help promote what needs to be done to preserve good use for waterways. Dublin uses 300 million litres of water a day. It has available to them 600 million litres of water a day. On the worst day of the drought last summer, they were short 5 million litres of water. The proposal is to take 330 million litres out of the Shannon. There is absolutely no need for Dublin to have accessible to it 940 million litres of water a day. There is no city of 10 million people with that sort of water available to them. No country in Europe uses systems like Irish Water are using to justify projected growth in demand. If any factory with water demand wants to come to Ireland, where's he going to go? Where the 940 million litres are available? Dublin. It's not necessary, it's just giving Dublin the future that the rest of Ireland deserves. Why am I, as a taxpayer, paying to take a pipe to Dublin to give Dublin all the future? Because this water is not necessary up there, but if they create the demand up there, Dublin is going to become a mega city because they're going to have the supply of water capable of doing it. So that's a very interesting point, that the availability of water is going to determine economic growth of a particular area. Yes. So Shannon has the water, so really, in an ideal world, economic development should actually be coming towards the Shannon, not the other way around as is happening. The greatest amount of water ever used in Dublin was 315 million litres in one day. Okay. They will have available to them 940 after this pipe is built. The waterway system is the most magical place, really, that I've ever experienced. The very essence of being on the water, it's so peaceful, it's so tranquil. There's people who've developed the ideas of trails. Donald Boland, for instance, is trying to develop a tranquility trail. Bernie Moran, who runs Native Guide in Moat, she is doing some work on monastic sites that were on higher parts of Ireland in the Midlands and is trying to chart all the routes that might have taken place between different monasteries. Just the sense of enjoying life and being able to appreciate life, really, I think, from, from a lot of different points of view. For me, at the centre of it uh, needs to be the spiritual needs of the people mm. who live and work and play around the banks of the Shannon. We need to develop a future for them where they can live in their own places, where they can have good, prosperous lives in their own places. So we do need development along the Shannon of one sort or another, but it needs to be very carefully crafted development mm. so that it doesn't damage the natural heritage, the built heritage, the cultural heritage which we all value so very much. The Shannon Waterways Corridor to designate the waterway plus also the land around the waterway as a protected landscape. Mm. And within that, the state land, and there's a lot of state land that is owned, to designate that as a Shannon National Park.
The Shannon Basin actually has a population similar to the size of the population of Dublin. And that's what people forget. So politically, it should be as powerful an area as Dublin. But people seem to get involved in a politics that doesn't work in rural Ireland. At best, since the famine, the population is falling or stagnant at best in the Shannon catchment area. Right? So, yes, we do need to improve tourism, we do need to improve agriculture, we do need to improve the amount of employment that is being produced by tourism and <coughs> agriculture. Tourism is all very well, it employs a certain number of people. If we are really going to develop the rural part of Ireland, we do need industry. Industry that will require water. But why do I wake up and read the paper and listen to the radio and hear about a new tube out to the airport, a new runway, a new this, a new that in Dublin? an incinerator inside in the middle of the city, a hospital inside in the middle of the city. And where I live is dying. If you go to other towns along the area up through Atlone, 20 miles left and right of the Shannon, they're all struggling. And we're electing representatives in every election who play the system. They get a net for the back of the goals in the hurling field. They get a walkway around the soccer field. And we're all supposed to be happy. At the moment, the system is not working for rural Ireland. If the population of an area has fallen for 150 years, maybe we should start asking questions of our politicians to know why are we not getting the development that Dublin's getting. If you go to the north of Italy, around the Italian lakes, there's much more development there than there is here at the moment. But what you find is every little valley has its own small light engineering business. Mm. People have good, well-paid employment. And we can do the same sort of thing here if we only focus on going about it the right way. And that would be the saving for the communities and the towns in the Shannon Corridor. They can't get housing in Dublin. Semi-detached, ordinary houses for seven, eight hundred thousand, out of the reach of anyone but millionaires. And yet we have towns with empty housing. Why not move people out of Dublin? You know, why does everything have to be in Dublin? When you have a government that bring in a spatial strategy that said there is nobody going to get assistance unless he's in a town of 10,000 people plus, that means towns like Nina, Turles, Burr, Rossgray, Lockray, Balnaslow are never going to get a penny of investment again. I dispute that. But so the, 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 the spatial strategy stays it. Tipperary is actually not even mentioned in it. To concentrate its resources in places where it can build sustainable development, which does happen to be based on a certain base of population. And that's the way things have developed internationally. You look at other communities that have dispersed and just died because they've been too distributed. Yeah, but if you actually look at the Shannon well. Basin, one third of the population of the country live in the Shannon's Drake mm -hmm. catchment area. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that there's only one town in that area which is at Lone now, maybe I'm wrong, but that's the only town that's entitled to any development. No, of course But not. that is the, what the spatial strategy is saying. It's not. It's highlighting it that as the centre of population. <laughs> <There's a plan. laughs> but this, before this, we, before I, we know, this, know. this has been a very robust conversation. And I suppose really what I have heard is that the Shannon is a vital lifeline in the country, that the communities along it are in decline in some ways while there is uncontrolled growth in Dublin to a certain extent and we need to redress the balance. There's a lot of conflict over how we use the Shannon and I suppose at the end of the day we're all going to have to work together on it. May I finish perhaps with a little poem? My heart certainly echoes W.B. Yeats in his great poem The Lake Isle of Inish Free. I will arise and go now for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. When I arrive in Gary Kennedy, I head straight for Larkins on the shores of Loch Derg, where I meet up with renowned whistle player Fiona Gardner in session along with Porrick Highland and Niall Hellebert.
six of my journey along the Shannon begins in Gary Kennedy on the eastern shore of Loch Derg, a very popular stop-off point for people cruising along the river. and I are really looking forward to arriving in Limerick City by evening time. When I got married 50 years ago this year, I actually moved to County Kildare and oh my God, how I miss the Shannon. The parish is an island and consequently, most of the people there way back made their living in salmon fishing. The Abbey fishermen, they were put off the Shannon by Ardna Crusha. And there's a very, very famous battle. It's called the Battle of the Tail Race. When they began to build Ardna Crusha, when the poor salmon came up the river to spawn, they were caught in the turbines and just made mincemeat of. The salmon fishermen took up the cause and they got 24 boats to go up the tail race to fish, despite the fact that they had been banned from fishing. Consequently, the bailiffs came, confiscated the boats, put them up into Sarsfield barracks. The bats it was a swimming area that was constructed with dressing rooms and so on. Today, unfortunately, you can't swim there anymore because a lot of damage has been done to the Shannon by way of pollution. There are a number of organisations and individuals have done huge work in preserving the heritage, like the Heritage Boat Association, who have documented the histories of pretty much all the working boats that are or were on the Shannon. I think a lot of the history is there. What we're probably losing is the oral history. The old boatmen are dying out. I knew one of the last of the Abbey fishermen, Cyril Mulcahy. As far as I know, he was one of the last to have actually fished in that area. The people who operated the spoon dredgers are gone. So we've lost that and we don't know how that work was done. So I, I think that's a pity. But, you know, we haven't lost it at all. There's still a lot of good stuff right. being done. There's more history there that we can't even imagine. You know, we keep on digging and finding new stories and, and more stories. I think it's important that we make an effort to connect children and bring them out, show them the waterways, bring them to the river's edge and go for walks, talk and explore the different senses with them. If you're watching water on the telly, they don't get to touch it and put their hand in and have that experience. So. We need to pass the Shannon on to the coming generation. Our children, our grandchildren, and those come after them. The Shannon is their inheritance, it's their legacy, and they're entitled to have it passed on in as pristine condition as we can manage. There's an obligation on us to do all we can to make sure that that happens. We do that by guarding against any harmful effects that can come about as a result of over-exploitation, pollution. There are those who would seek to over-exploit the Shannon for financial gain and for many wrong reasons. If we don't fight against this over-exploitation, we won't have a Shannon with integrity. It will be a degraded river because you cannot take and take and take and take. And we have seen around the world the results of over-extraction. It's frightening if you study it at all. We have the opportunity here in Ireland to do the proper thing. Okay. Right. Get the children to talk to their grandparents, to talk to their own parents, their memories of the river. My mother would hand us bottles of milk. There were lemonade bottles and a glass newspaper kind of folded like a cork. Tell the children that's the way it was. I mean, I'm looking at my own grandchildren at home and my husband is saying to me, take those things off them, they're not talking. I'm sure every grandparent is despairing because you'd love a child to talk to you. If you go way up north, up the river, up into Acres Lake, there's a beautiful new floating boardwalk which brings people literally right down onto the water and they can appreciate all the various things that are going on, the wildlife and so on. And at the same time, they're on a safe boardwalk. I know one of the great pleasures of my own life is bringing my two grandchildren out in our canoe. And they get such fun out of just being in a little canoe paddling close to the water. It really does bring them very close to it. But of course, Nobody sees that. That's not a disaster story, so that kind of story doesn't make a lot of attention. I think there's actually a lot of good stuff going on. But we now have 
two white-tailed eagles nesting and breeding on the Shannon. The Shannon has lots of islands in it with lots of trees. It's suitable habitat for these majestic birds. And it's a joy to see the eagle, massive wingspan, swooping down and just like that, taking up a fish in its claws and back to the nest. And you know that they're either feeding themselves or feeding young, but they have successfully bred for the past three or four years. So it's a great thing to see, but we have to protect it. I suppose the Shannon, it continues to inspire writers and poets. It always has fun and some of the beautiful pieces that come out from people just by sitting there looking at the river, looking at the sunset and the sunrise and seeing the magical colours that you can't really see in other parts along the coastline and that's what makes it kind of magical and unique just to sit there and listen to the sound of the birds and the sound of the lapping water that's constant through time that'll still be there for our grandchildren and their children and that will remain the same i think a nine o'clock twilight and rooks roost on ruddock's trees their raucous cawing leaps across the lax weir to bounce on the old toll house our small boat sighs forward with each dipping of paddles, creating a widening V in the summer smooth Shannon. I, man and oar, sunburn stinging my neck after a picnic day on St. Thomas Island. Dad begins to sing, There's a tree in the meadow, points to me for the next line, a tree passing by, my brother for the next. And where'er I go, you'll always know I love you till I die. The old grey heron stands still in the shallows under the metal bridge. We ruffle his feathers and he shifts from one leg to the other until we glide by, turning into the Abbey River on an easy ebb tide home. I spent the last night of my trip along the Shannon in Limerick City where I had the great pleasure of meeting up with students from the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at UL. my seventh and final day travelling down the river and today I hope to travel from Limerick City down the estuary. The river has had a pivotal role in the growth of the city and the clue to this is in the street names Arthur Key, Honan's Key and George's Key. My first port of call this morning is to City Hall on Merchant's Key to speak with Anne Goggins, a senior engineer with Limerick County Council who has responsibility for a number of areas including water quality. Our team is involved in implementing the Water Framework Directive and the River Basin Management Plan at local level. Our primary focus is on agriculture because agriculture is the biggest pressure on water quality in Limerick. We have a lot of issues in Limerick and in some of the rivers that flow into the Shannon estuary, the Deal and the Maig particularly, they're quite over enriched with nutrients and that's starting to impact on the upper Shannon estuary, which is a little bit worrying. Our role then would be to look at where the inputs are coming from within our functional area 
and to try and work with the stakeholders to mitigate those inputs. So if it's agricultural inputs, looking at whether it's runoff from the fields, whether, whether it's issues on the farmyard and working with the farmers to deal with those. We'd also have a role in looking at things like septic tanks, urban discharges, discharges from industry. In terms of agriculture, the basic measure identified under the River Basin Management Plan is the good agricultural practice regulations. So a lot of our efforts would be working with farmers to make sure they're fully compliant with those. But the new plan acknowledges that they might not be sufficient in all areas and there may be a need for additional measures. There are certain areas identified in the River Basin Management Plan called Priority Areas for Action and there are special teams set up called the Local Authority Waters Programme which is a shared service between all local authorities operating at regional level. And their role is to work with specialist agricultural advisors and to look at what else can be done where they identify specific problems. So what other measures that go beyond the basic measures in the good agricultural practice can be taken to help mitigate the effects of agriculture. But at the moment we're finding that water quality is going downhill rather than improving, which is quite a worrying trend. Nationally there's been a decline of about 3% since 2015. And in Limerick generally the situation is worse than the national situation. Nationally about 56% of river water bodies are at satisfactory status. In Limerick it's only 47%. And of the water bodies where status has been established, it's estimated that 60% of the water bodies in Limerick are at risk of not meeting their objectives under the Water Framework Directive. So it's quite worrying, particularly in light of a downward trend. So they're under quite a lot of pressure. In actual fact, the impact of wastewater treatment plants in Limerick is relatively limited. So now the national situation is that there's only two water bodies that are at bad status. On the national stage, 53% of water bodies that are at risk, the primary pressure is agriculture. And I think the figure for urban wastewater treatment plants is about 20%. Now, another problem area that we haven't looked at is, of course, industry. And I suppose one of the biggest industries in County Limerick is the Arnish Alumina plant along the estuary. There's a 450-acre site there of waste residue, and 150 acres of that is not lined. So there is a possibility that some of that might leach into groundwater. And the Council have recently granted planning permission for blasting to take place in that area. We planned permission for the planning aspects of it, but all of the environmental impacts of a big industry like Ohanish, they're controlled by the EPA. While we look at the planning aspects, we can't impose environmental conditions. So under their industrial emissions licence, they would aim to control all of the activities on the site to ensure they don't cause pollution. Would you think that there might be a danger that various bodies and authorities are not linked up with each other, that there's a kind of a disconnect there between local authorities and the EPA? We work very closely with the EPA. We would make submissions where relevant on various things and they are very much now engaged with local authorities and with the local authorities' water programme to their catchments unit. They produced the River Basin Management Plan this time round, and they're involved in coordinating a lot of the agencies that are required to act under it. So I think there's a good relationship with the EPA. The water quality on the whole in the Shannon is relatively good. It's a beautiful river and a real asset, so it would be nice to see it more widely used for amenity. Well, and thank you so much for talking to me today. I've stepped out of City Hall and gone next door to St Mary's Cathedral, the oldest building in Limerick City, where the canon Patrick Comerford is the author of many books and is a member of the General Synod of the Church of Ireland. Father Sean McDonough is a Columban missionary priest who has written several books on the environment and was part of the team who advised Pope Francis for his encyclical on the environment, Laudata Si. I wrote a book called Dying for Water and I think water is the most extraordinary reality and future wars will be fought over water. The reality is the war in Syria is actually part of the destruction that has come from what has happened to water in the world today. And we don't often see that as part of our religious and also our moral reality. In the various churches, we invite people to become part of our church by the reality of baptism. But does anyone ever test the waters of baptism? Are they polluted? Are they dangerous? So we don't make that connect. I believe every church 
should every year have a, a Sunday where they send off from all the churches, they send off their water. Is this water pure? Is it the kind that can give the new life? The reality is it's a moral issue. Four days without water and we're dead. The condition of fresh water in Ireland has deteriorated gradually over the last 40 years for a lot of reasons industry, the agriculture we have produced. Now we have a huge obligation to change all that because there's no reason why people should be drinking polluted water. If I was teaching, for example, now something on the church, you know where I'd bring people? Down to an oak tree. Here's a species that promotes the growth of about 300 other species. That's what church is about. The care of God's creation is a biblical task for all of humanity. At the end of it all, we need to have a river that gives life to all. There will be a tree whose leaves will give healing not just to all nations but to anyone who takes from it. There's no discrimination, it's there for all to take but we have a responsibility as the church to care for that creation. It's very significant that Bridget builds her first church, Kildara, the church of the oak tree. Uh, this cathedral here, St. Mary's Cathedral in Limerick, stands on an island on the banks of the River Shannon. In the last 30 years, the instant populations has fallen by 40%. That's globally. That's an extraordinary figure. 30% of our food comes from actually pollinators. Seabirds here coming from the winter are down by something like 40%. This is what's telling us what's happening to our environment. We should take that seriously. We have 98 species of bees in this country. And you know what? One third of them are facing extinction. I mean, that's extraordinary. I'd be asking people who have lawns around the church to leave places for dandelions at this time of the year. If we cut all the dandelions, we're doing enormous damage to the bees because the bees become extinct when they have no food and no place to live. So that we'd be more sensitive to this and that we allow God's creatures to speak to us. And I would love to see if all of the Christian churches took it more seriously as the basis of their faith in the moment we're living in. We're living in a, in a particular moment. We're not living in the 19th century or the 14th century. We're living when we realize what we're doing to the natural world. All I would want to say is we begin to respond to that and do something about it. Christ constantly talks about himself as giving the water of life. His ministry begins with baptism in the water when the waters part like a new creation. His first sign in St. John's Gospel is with water at the wedding at Cana. His first proclamation of himself is a one-to-one -one with a Samaritan woman at the well when he talks about the water of life. He calms the waters of the troubled seas so that he is the Lord of creation. When he dies, water flows from his side. If we need to understand who we truly are as humans, we need to understand our place within God's creation and then we become the people that God has made us to be. And I think that's a really wonderful note on which to end. Thank you. Okay. I've stepped out into the sunlight and walked a short distance along the river to the Lock Bar. I'm fortunate that two musicians from the Academy of Irish Music in the University of Limerick who regularly play here are entertaining the clientele as they have lunch. Conor Broderick from Galway is on keyboard and Brendan McCarthy from Cork is on box. Today is the final day of my journey that began in Loch Allen six days ago. I've come down the river with the flame of St. Bridget and the pure drop of water. I've been chatting to people about why we need to protect the river for future generations. We live in an area called Eskeaton. There's an aluminum refinery down there, but the problem is their waste is left at the Shannon Estuary. And it's toxic waste, Anna. That's our problem. And there's about 50 million tonnes of it in open ponds. You know, and it blows, it leaks into the Shannon because the planning originally allowed for 70 acres of it. 
it was never lined. So since 1983, it's been leaking into the Shannon. People who fly in from America can look down and I find the and see all this red underneath the water. And no one seems to care. You're here today saying, how do we protect the Shannon? Well, I can say we've lost our chance in protecting the Shannon because the damage has been done from this toxic waste being left there. County Council don't seem to care. The EPA don't seem to care. No one seems to care. It's money for this industry. They produce alumina, they export it abroad and they leave us the waste and it'll cost billions to clean up. But the problem is the walls could collapse. There's even a planning permission already granted for blasting just metres from it. So if they breach the embankments, the toxic waste is into the Shannon and that's the end of it. So we feel we are losing the fight in saving the Shannon. There was never much opposition because it was all about jobs. Everything is done in the name of jobs because our environment is being ruined. And I think it's thanks to social media, it's thanks to yourself, Anna. They may be thinking of taking this red mud into our cement and burning it there. There will be another escaping, there will be another environmental problem. It just happens because this company is not going to clean up. The Irish government isn't going to make a clean up. It's a Russian company. So tough luck, lads. You have it there and forget about your environment. It's all over for our area. One of the biggest environmental threats in Europe is happening in our area right now, and that's Shannon LNG, a terminal for imported American fracked gas. It would be built in Tarbert on the Kerry side. Ireland has banned fracking, but the plan at the moment is to bring in enormous amounts of this American fracked gas, which has the most ferocious emissions of any of the fossil fuels, actually. It used to be seen as a clean transition fuel, but it isn't anymore. It leaks methane at every opportunity, and this stuff is 86 times more destructive than carbon dioxide over a 20-year period. So on a global scale, it's very damaging. The plan would be to bring in 104 super tanker trips a year into the Shannon estuary as far as Tarbert on the Kerry side. Now half of this gas would be for Irish use, the rest would travel on through the network into the UK and onto Europe. Now in the UK, it's mostly used to make plastics. So we've had ridiculous situations where we've had local politicians, MEP Sean Kelly, doing an anti-plastics rally. But actually these people are supporting this industry on an enormous scale. They would take estuary water, 100 million gallons of it every single day. It would be cooled in the process of warming up the gas. So what you have is water that goes back out at maybe 11 degrees lower than it was. So the fact of having this cold water is devastating to the estuary food chain. It just about finishes it. Shannon LNG would be built exactly in an EU area of special protection for marine wildlife. The site itself has this ledge, this drop off, which is perfect for the dolphins and perfect for the world's biggest super tankers. If this terminal is built, it's going to change what's left of the Shannon forever. It'll be the food chain, it'll be tourism, it'll be 104 super tanker trips passing Loop Head and coming into the estuary every year. It's hugely strategically, geopolitically important. We have hundreds, thousands of supporters actually across the city and we are exposing the complete inefficacy, the uselessness, actually, of the government bodies that are supposed to protect us. And on that list, we have the Environmental Protection Agency, who over the last 18 months have basically been holding the hand of Irish cement through the process which will grant them a licence to turn their cement kiln into a for-profit incinerator burning industrial and municipal waste. Irish Cement is seeking a license for 90,000 tonnes of waste a year. What Limerick is going to have to face going forward if this license is granted is essentially a profoundly toxic atmosphere that is going to blow emissions from this cement works across the city, that is going to see the air turned into essentially a great cancerous stream which will affect the health of the people of that city and of the Shannon estuary in a way that will destroy lives and families and land and water and we will become not what we're told a great new dimension of the wild Atlantic way but rather a huge toxic ecosystem. The current minister with the portfolio looking after the environment Richard Bruton uh, began his career before he went into politics as chief economist for Cement Roadstone Holdings. So what you can see with that appointment is that 
the very senior figures in the current government are themselves invested in CRH actually starting to get their way with this billion dollar project. We have nothing to hide. We know we have right on our side. We have nothing to do except expose the truth and the rotten heart of the politics that is allowing this to go ahead. We have essentially said that we will stop at virtually nothing to prevent this from happening. The River Shannon is the jewel in the crown in Ireland. It pips off of 16 counties from Dingle to Fermanagh. And what happens to River Shannon will have an impact on the future generations in our country. The system and the Shannon have been failed by politicians, bureaucrats and multinationals. They seem to buy their way into dirty industry and the essence of their results is pollution of the River Shannon. We have two areas of Limerick where we actually do not have habitable fish. An area in Arganish and there's an area in Castle Mungrel. The big problem for us is the fauna and the marine life. And with the dirty industries, and they're going on now six decades in our region, and there's no one standing up for the river, there's no one standing up for the people until of late. And we now see the opportunity for four or five different groups in the Limerick Clare region to come together and stand as a unit to take on the politicians and the planners. We have lost our rights. The, the governments, successive governments, have taken away the, the planning authority, which was an executive role for local councillors. That law was under 143A of the Local Government Act. The minister removed that act, and he gave executive powers to the CEOs of all the councils in relation to planning decisions. Furthermore, the EPA, when it was set up in 1993, it was set up with immunity for their actions and their decisions. That immunity wasn't specifically set up to protect the officers of EPA. It was set up to protect the ministers, the TDs, and the local councillors who were in the full face of bad planning decisions. By giving immunity to the EPA, they also gave themselves immunity. And here is the big problem for planning decisions on environment on the River Shannon and we must take a stand and eradicate this. The powers are vested in the CEO of the local authority. Right. We have 16 local authorities involved in around the ambit of the River Shannon. But throughout the country, all the CEOs have executive powers only in planning decisions. All the CEOs of lately, they're all government appointees. They're all dictated to. All these managers and CEOs, they all meet once, twice a month, and they all make decisions, but they don't actually go with the decisions unless it's approved at ministerial level, especially the big ones. We have Anne-Marie's problem with the LPG, Angus's problem with Irish Cement, Pat's problem with Arganish, we have our problem with the River Shannon, but we're all combined and we're all speaking as one unit. And it's people power must get this ready to protect and rescue the River Shannon. The council from day one wants to get you into the EPA system. The EPA are run by government. Let's not fool ourselves because this is what has been happening. They grant licences without taking into consideration anything and that's why they're able to do it on the immunity. If anyone designed it didn't have the immunity, then it would come back on that person within the EPA to be held accountable, to be taken to the courts and to be prosecuted. In 2007, there was a statutory body set up through the European Environmental Council endorsed by the Irish government and that was the River Shannon Basin Group. I was elected chair. It was a national body. Representation from 16 counties were on that and we used to meet once a month. The remit was to look at the pollution of the River Shannon and we uncovered a lot of things of foreign ships coming in and discharging ballast, mussel problems, wild species problems coming in. When that committee was at its most powerful, the issue of extraction of water from the River Shannon to Dublin became our primary concern. And we started to meet once a week on the issue. It was so important for the people of Ireland. In 2008, Minister Hogan disbanded that committee because we were getting too powerful and we weren't taking yes for an answer. And that was the result of the power of the politicians. They didn't like what was coming down the gravy train and they suspended that committee and it has yet to be re-endorsed. We have launched a platform here today. We have four key players 
who are prepared to stick their neck out and meet the concerted groups, not only throughout Limerick and Clare, but out Munster and the rest of the country. So we have the platform, so let's see where it goes from here. This part of the world has always been strategically important, and you can see this going back to the late 50s when the first free trade zone was set up at Shannon. What we're really witnessing here is, without anyone really being told about it, is a whole new and more vicious, violent, brutal form of late capitalism being imposed upon this area. Europe needs to essentially have a greater level of energy security. At the moment, it depends too much on its gas and energy coming from the east, from Russia and the Ukraine and so forth. For Europe... To do that, it needs to essentially bring in frack gas from America. Munster, which is essentially the nearest part of the European mainland to the States, is the perfect place to bring that frack gas into. The reason Irish cement are looking to burn rubbish is because China now has essentially stopped the importation of rubbish. So there is a huge amount of rubbish that needs to be dealt with uh, in different parts of the world. And rubbish has become massively profitable. Irish cement are going to probably get around 250 euros a ton to burn rubbish. 250 euros for a 90,000 ton license is a lot of money. But they now, in Platin, north of Dublin, Irish cement have a license to burn 600,000 tons of rubbish a year. Now that works out more or less at over four hundred thousand euros a day that is a lot of money there is huge money at stake in this rubbish business landfill is now no longer really permissible europe is doing its best to dispense with rubbish going to landfill a much easier and essentially more insidious and less conspicuous way of dealing with rubbish is essentially to incinerate it and put the pollution into the atmosphere because it's much much harder to essentially measure it in terms of the harm it can do. What this whole Shannon estuary is being turned into is this toxic ecosystem. What we have to do essentially is draw our own strengths together in order to oppose that. It's extremely difficult to do that because politics now is so welded to business interest in the name of job security that very few people are prepared to really stick their neck out and oppose issues that in any way challenge the lifestyles that they've become accustomed to. It's only the people who essentially can see the bigger picture, can read the immense damage this is going to do to both the health of people and to the environment in the years to come. Those are the people who are making a stand. The more people who make that stand, the better. Anyone that's looking at at us today, and we apologise for causing you any bit of distress and finishing (laughs) off your journey, they will look at us and say, oh, look, that's down in West Limerick. We needn't worry about it. Yes, they have to worry about it because these are emissions. The emissions will travel hundreds and hundreds of miles. Once they're airborne, they'll get to everyone sooner or later. This is a system that they are using to destroy Ireland. And they will destroy Ireland. They're well underway in destroying many parts of Ireland. So what we're saying here today is, Don't let it happen to you wherever you are. Stand up and fight and we all need to come together to stop this destroying Ireland. Bring the people of Ireland together regardless of east, south, west, north. Let's come together. There is hope for the River Shannon but we've got to do it. It has to come from the people. We've lost the faith in the system, in the bureaucracy and we've lost the faith in the politicians. We need to stand up and take them on. Yeah, we do need jobs, but the argument we keep making for Shannon LNG is you're looking at 50 long-term jobs in this one plant, which is damaging millions of people around the world because even though we're fighting it locally, the effects are global. And then when you look at between, you know, Clare and Kerry, we've got 21,000 jobs in tourism and you have a politician fighting for 50 jobs at Shannon LNG and they're not interested in those 50 jobs, really. They're interested in that big geopolitical strategic picture that's driven by corporate interests, by industrialisation and by your 
Europe and by the Trump administration. One of the most beautiful parts of this region is that really ancient landscape of early Christianity. In one way, we need to reconnect with those ancient narratives. We really have to understand that our responsibility is not to the violent and brutal production of endless, devastating profit that essentially ruins lives and environments without any form of liability to be accounted for in the present generation. And we must really understand it is those ancient, otherworldly dimensions that should offer us hope in what are very dark times. We have to admit that. On that note, we can look to the flame of St. Bridget that I have carried the whole way down the Shannon, which helps us to reconnect with our ancient Christian roots, so rooted in respect for nature. And that was the hallmark of early Christianity. The really wonderful thing is that people are starting to wake up and people are starting to connect with each other. The real hope for the river lies in the fact that ordinary people are now, for the first time, starting to become really, really active, getting out there to protect the river for future generations. We're here now standing at the estuary with Ahnish in the background. It's visually very powerful. One of the things that inspired me on my journey was your environmental activism for the last 20 years, the work that you have done to protect the environment. So i just like to gift you with the piece to... Oh, thank, you thank you very much. Thank you. We've been fighting this for 20 years with minimum success, but hopefully... The help of Zane Bridget and everything. We'll get, we'll, we'll get another 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and let's hope the next 20 years will be better. We don't do this for our family, we do it for all families. Yes. And for future generations, your family, my family, everyone's family. It's the environment. We all breathe the air, and all we're looking for is clean air to breathe and clean water. And thank you, Anna, for this. You're more than welcome. So, my journey along the Shannon, from the Shannon Pot to the Shannon Estuary, has ended here with Ahnish Illumina in the background. And it has been a wonderful, magical journey where I've spoken to many people along the way. And my prayer at the journey end is that for the first time ever, Irish people will really waken up to the fact that we need to protect our environment for future generations. May our air, our water and our land be blessed by the flame of St. Bridget. Thank you.